Hello. Thank you. So um, thanks very much for the introduction. I'm here to talk about bananas, technology, and magic. Um, so I'm Adrian, and I run a, um, a studio in London called Vitamins. It's a design and invention studio. And uh, my background's in uh, kind of technology and magic. I came from electronic engineering, uh, but I've also been doing magic since the age of 11. So these were my kind of two childhood heroes, um, one which uh, played with a lot of electricity, Tesla, um, on the right, and then Di Vernon. I do, if anybody knows Di Vernon, I'd be, I'd be very impressed. But he's um, one of the fathers of modern card magic. So my mum was really happy about this guy, not so happy about this guy when I was kind of playing with stuff when I was 11. And um, I got into magic because I, um, I really wanted to make one of my teachers disappear at school. And I wrote to one of the most famous magicians on TV at the time. I didn't even know his address. I was 11 years old, and I wrote Paul Daniels BBC on the envelope. Oh, and, um, and it got to him, and then a week later, he told me how to make my teacher disappear, and I found an amazing community online, much like the kind of Arduino communities and stuff you get now. Um, so to kind of turn this passion into a profession, I teamed up with a really great um, uh, product designer and an amazing uh, mechanical engineer, and we set up a multidisciplinary design studio. So to give you an idea of the kind of work that we do, um, this is a folding wheelchair wheel that we... Um, uh, patented about four years ago and is now actually in production right now, uh, which is really exciting. And it's a full-sized, I'm hearing some ghosts, uh, it's a full-sized wheelchair wheel that can fold completely flat. So you can kind of take that with you on the overhead locker in the plane or in the front seat of your car. Um, but to then give you an idea of the range of the things that we do, this is some work we did with BlackBerry, looking at mobile interruptions and trying to make interruptions slightly more human. So what we did is we figured out a way of actually checking a text message on your phone by just squeezing the phone itself. And that message actually appears imprinted on your finger. So you can be talking to someone and just see that message on your finger and then just rub that off. Very James Bond. Um, but today I'm going to talk about a project we did with Samsung and the Helen Hamlin Center in London, which is part of the Royal College of Art. And they asked us to design a mobile phone for older people. That was the brief. So quite open. And they didn't define what older people meant, which is really nice, because we didn't really want to limit it to a certain age. But it was a, a, a mobile phone for older people. Now, there's a popular myth uh, amongst designers when it comes to aging. And it looks a little bit like this. A lot of designers think that when you get old, you're kind of lonely, you're living in poverty, like this image, and you like things to be beige and gray. And it's a very kind of negative view on aging. Um, and a lot of products come out uh, which are made with this image in mind. Um, we find that the real picture was quite different. Uh, in England, um, over 50s control, I think it's over 80% of the wealth in the UK. They're fit and they travel frequently and have very active social lives. Um, but the problem is, is that a lot of designs focus on disabilities rather than abilities. So if you go out looking for a smartphone, or, well, a phone, sorry, for um, an older person, you're going to get these things. They call them silver phones. And uh, I think they're incredibly stigmatizing. I mean, there's, um, I mean, there's so many reasons why they're so bad. Like, for a start, they don't even have enough digits to dial a number. So talk about empowering someone by giving them a mobile phone. They can't even dial a number. You have to get, give someone the SIM card to program in your top four numbers, because uh, you only have four friends when you're older, apparently. And, um, and then you can only phone those people. Um, and also, if that's not bad enough, they all have a big SOS button on it, because when you're older, you're going to die any minute, of course. And uh, you know. You've got to be constantly reminded by that. And I like this one in the middle, because it's got um, different levels of emergency. So you've got the operator, which is green. Then you've got the tow truck, which is yellow. And then 911, which is red. Um, so we think that they've really been designed with kind of by looking at disabilities. And we really wanted to focus on abilities instead to kind of reframe the problem. Um, and this talk is all about going out and spending time with people in the design process. So that's what we did. We went and bought phones with people of all ages in their 20s, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And we, we'd buy phones. And they all had one thing in common, is that they were incredibly excited. You give someone some money and you say, you can choose a phone, you know, they're going to be excited. But something really interesting happened when we got back to the studio to open up the boxes. And you can see it here. Um, Duncan's in his 20s. The first thing he does is just grabs the phone out of the box, throws the manual away, and just starts playing with the phone. Within two minutes, he's, he can send a text. He'd never used that phone before. 
Beverly, who's in her 60s, does something very different. Look at what she's doing. She's looking for help inside the box. First thing she does is she grabs the manual. She checks that the right phone, that's, uh, you know, the right model number that's written in the manual is in the box, that the headset is there, that the charger is there. She starts reading all of the legal thing at the beginning, the three pages uh, um, explaining you know, how you can't throw it. Uh, into a glass of water and stuff like that. So there's a fundamental difference in the way that um, these two people were approaching technology. And um, all that excitement in the store, uh, when they, the excitement they had about buying a phone, which is really you know, useful uh, from an experience point of view, was wasted. Because by the end of this, she just wanted to throw the phone across the room and you know, say, I'm not really for technology. So we thought this is where we should act. Um, and in fact, it's not just older people. 85% of all users of all ages uh, report frustration in the difficulty of setting up a new phone. Um, so we went out and spent more time with users. We did um, individual home visits. So we'd go to people's homes. And it's really, really important to, to try and see the kind of context in which you know, your, your, the product is being used in. Um, it's also really important that the designer is the researcher. Rather than kind of you know, getting some research done and getting some graphs back, it's really important to connect with the user. And if you're the designer and you're asking questions, you're going to be starting to think about solutions. And that's going to guide that research. So we would go and spend time with people in Teams never more than two. Sometimes we'd film it, sometimes we wouldn't. It didn't really matter. It was all about just observing what was going on. So um, we wanted to see how people learned things in different ways. So we wanted to see how people learned alone, in couples, and in groups, and see how those dynamics change things. Um, so this lady, um, she had a, a brand new digital SLR, a really good one, um, that she'd had in a box that she hadn't opened. Um, she was waiting six months for her daughter to come back from Canada at Christmas to open the box with her, because she just assumed it would be too difficult. Um, it was also interesting to see how couples learn. There was usually a kind of tech-savvy person in the couple who would kind of learn the tech and then translate it and explain it to someone else. Really interesting things going on. Um, this couple in particular had learned using the Open University platform. So they'd learned quite complex subjects uh, on the TV, through the radio. Uh, and they were currently using YouTube to learn how to um, soup up their car to make it go faster, which was really impressive. I don't know if it, I don't know if it worked, actually. Um, and then we also spoke to this bingo group in London. Uh, you know, they were kind of much older on the spectrum. And that really taught us a lot, because they weren't living very mobile lifestyles. So they just didn't see the benefits in mobile phones at all. And it taught us that if you don't see the benefits in something, then you're not going to bother learning it. You have to be able to see the benefits. And a lot of the time, um, those benefits aren't communicated very well. Like you'll open the box, and there'll be, you know, if I imagine my mum opening the box, and there's all these leaflets for free MP3s. It's just, you know, she might not kind of get into it and put the energy in to learn. So then after that, we spent more time with people. We created some workshops to really break down the whole out-of-box process. Now, um, we did these workshops in London. We did them in Norway and in Italy as well, because we wanted to get a kind of quite pan-European perspective. And um, what we did, it, was, it sounds quite complex, but we actually um, asked people to create a phone in the workshop, then create the box and the packaging for it. And then they would have to write a manual for their invented phone and then sell it to, to the other people in the group. And then the people in the group would have to learn how to do it. So that took six hours, six people in six hours. Um, and and it, worked, um, you know, it worked very well. And we tried not to talk about technology. We kind of tried to keep it very aspirational. Uh, we were doing magic tricks as well, just to kind of make people get away from the tech uh, uh, nightmare. Um, and you'll notice here, this is where the bananas come in. This guy here is writing on a banana. Um, now, there's a reason for this. Uh, we really wanted an honest portrayal of what people wanted. So if you give someone a sheet of A4 with an outline of a phone on it, and you say, uh, how do you want your phone to be? Then you're going to get what you asked for, basically. You're going to get some buttons and a screen in different kind of combinations. We really wanted to break away from that. So we gave them bananas, and we said, turn this banana into your dream phone. Do what you want. We, we were kind of giving them anything they needed, stickers, ribbons, whatever. And um, you know, they were free to really create what they wanted. And using this kind of analog media really broke away from the kind of constraints of, uh, of talking about technology. Um, oh, that's actually meant to be later. Um, this is actually a really great slide from the Rosetta Stone. Um, this is about the benefits, sorry. Um, this is a, the Rosetta Stone language learning um, DVDs. And to kind of motivate people to learn, they write, um, he was a hardworking farm boy. She was an Italian supermodel. He knew he would just have one chance to impress her. So that really communicates the, the benefits. But that was meant to be earlier, so sorry for that. So anyway, back to the bananas. 
some people just kind of continued doing what they were doing on paper on the bananas. So they were using them like a kind of organic post-it note. This guy just gave him a banana. He's like, can just continues writing on it as if nothing happened. But um, other people, you know, uh, taught us a lot of things. So this banana had a button to make the kids happy. It also had a GPS on it. So it had a kind of map of Britain, and there was a kind of flashing dot. What was really interesting with this is the guy who drew, made this banana had a GPS on his phone. And we asked him, you know, oh, why are you dreaming about a GPS when you've already got one? And he didn't even know it was in his phone. So that really taught us that people weren't exploring. We'd have to kind of break down that barrier to make people entice them to explore. Some of the bananas we still don't understand to this day, but we're still kind of working on it. There's, um, this one here is um, everything vocal, and then in brackets, even SMS. Um, so that's, you know, this could be Siri. Um, then there's a, behind it, there's a button for coffee, please, and um, watching films. So what this taught us is that older people didn't want those phones with four buttons that we saw at the beginning. They wanted, you know, a really complex social tool. They wanted a smartphone like everyone else. So we decided, let's not design another phone. Let's try and design a way of making a normal smartphone usable for them. So today's out-of-box experience looks a bit like this. You've got the user, and then you've got the manual, the box, and the device. And the user has to kind of do all the work to bring these bits of information together, like we saw in the video at the beginning. We wanted to create an experience that would bring everything together into one tight experience in one place. And rather than changing the device, we wanted to kind of create a bridge to that device that would enable them to, to use any device. So we picked a, an off-the-shelf smartphone, a fairly affordable one, and used that as our challenge. Now this is what we made quite a few uh, solutions. This is one of them. I'll show you two today. One of them was to tackle this thing about exploring. So we thought, you know, it's very difficult to explore a smartphone when you've never used those interfaces before. You don't really know how much it can do or how much you know it can do. So we made a, a, a box where the phone, you know, which contained the phone, and it contained a pack of cards. Now, each card explained one function of the phone. So each card, in a way, was like an app. And you can very quickly just explore with your fingers and see everything your phone can do. So you've got call someone, set an alarm, calculator, things like that. And in about five minutes, you can know everything your phone can do like that. It's a very familiar model. Um, but they're not normal cards. Uh, they're magic cards. You can just tap them on the phone, and it will actually shortcut to that function because they're NFC cards. So it kind of acts as a sort of analog shortcut to explore the device. Um, and the research taught us that people might want to you know, learn how to use their phone on the move as well. So we designed them so they could be taken with you in your wallet. But this was all about empowering people. It wasn't you know, about creating another kind of thing that they'd have to use. So on the back of every card, it would actually teach you how to do it on the menu. So the card is a sort of temporary analog shortcut. And then once you're kind of familiar with it, you don't have to use it anymore. And if you're happy carrying them with you, you can. Um, and this worked very well. This kind of re they really responded well to it. Um, these are some of the prototypes that we did. We experimented, you know, as designers do. We tried making origami folding cards with all sorts of things, but key, you know, um, different icons. But um, keeping it simple, just keeping it with plain text, like no icons, it just meant that it was just far more direct. Um, trying to find a, a kind of font that was, you know, friendly but not patronizing was really challenging. But trying to get that balance was very important. Now, this is the, the second idea, um, and it really um, came from that research, spending time in people's homes. We'd ask them, you know, do you still have the manual for your phone? And they'd always tell us yes, but it would be in a box, in another box, in another box, or it would be in a drawer under something else. Uh, they'd keep it, but it had nowhere to live. This, you know, this little manual hadn't really been designed to live anywhere. If you try and take it with you in your bag, it'll probably disintegrate within two weeks because the paper's so cheap. Um, so we thought um, a book is a fantastic kind of model to, to work with. Uh, a book has a place. A book is a familiar model. A book is linear. You know, if you have a kind of good quality book, you, know, you can have a good quality experience. So we redesigned the packaging around the book. And um, this is what we came up with. So you would buy this book in the shop, and it's exactly the same dimensions as the original packaging uh, of the phone that we picked. And the phone is actually inside the book. Uh, so this was the Samsung Toco Lite that we used in this example. Um, now, the setup was always the tricky bit. That's where the phone usually goes, ends up flying across the room. So that's what we started with. The first book does the setup. The first thing you see is your SIM card. And a lot of people don't know what a SIM card is if you've never seen one before. So we explain. It's the heart and soul of your phone. Next thing you see is where it actually goes in the phone. So the phone's inside. So the book's like a really fantastic linear model that's really familiar to do this. 
and we managed to kind of just progressively reveal the setup process using the book. But the book was the packaging as well. Um, and a lot of people think these would be quite expensive to make. Um, but you know, you've seen kind of children's books with quite complex pop-up things that you can buy for you know two or three pounds. So th this would deal with the setup, um, and it worked very well. We had like lots of prototypes. We you know spent a lot of time trying them out, and it was you know quite a delightful experience. It, it took something that was really kind of terrifying and made it quite good fun. The next one deals with the actual learning, the manual. This is what you'd use most of the time. So there's a contents like a normal book. There's an introduction. It's, there's no jargon. It doesn't say MMS, it says pictures. It tells you why you'd want to, to do that. And the phone actually fits inside the manual. And all of the instructions actually point around the phone. So you remember that video of Beverly, she's looking here, she's looking here, doing all this translation, but we brought it all into one place. Um, and it was incredibly effective. Um, there was a lot of temptation uh, you know, to kind of have a bit of a tech fest and make the phone aware about what page it was on, add all sorts of other levels of information. But what really worked well was that it was just a book and it just did that and you were in control of it. And again, you've got so many great cues with a book. You know your phone does this much. You know that you know this much. Uh, you can then put it on your shelf. Um, it doesn't make learning things out of your phone a kind of you know, a bad thing. It makes it a thing that's just um, expected. So that was the that was the the, the book project. So um, I'll just wait till this finishes. So hopefully you can see how going out and spending time with people is really really important in the design process, no matter what you're designing. And it's not that hard. You just need to kind of call people up and go around to their houses if if they allow it. Um, and hopefully you can see that by spending time with people, you can really design solutions that have um, you know a lot of depth and a lot of context by understanding not just you know the size of the hand that's holding it, but the room that they're in, what they're doing when they are actually using it. Um, so that's, um, that's me. I'm Adrian Westaway. Thanks for watching. Um, bye -bye. <laughs>